right, we're good to go. Thanks, Megan. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Jenny Beaver and I'm the CEO of Fourth Trimester Arizona, a grassroots 501c3 collaborative of parents, families, health professionals, educators, and local organizations. We're on a mission to change the culture of parenting so no one has to do it alone. Thank you for joining us today for our second Fourth Trimester Ecosystem Lunchtime Conversation. As supporters of Expectant and New Parents, today we invite you to collectively explore how COVID-19 has impacted infant feeding for our Arizona families. If you notice, we are debuting the new Fourth Trimester Ecosystem logo that was loving, lovingly designed by a local mother and designer, Marisa Wehunt. She did this while caring for her six-month-old, and we are so thrilled with how it came out. So I want to give her like a big round of applause here. Um, because it was amazing work and, you know, doing that while caring for a small child, <laughs> as we all know, is not easy. So um, we just love it and are just so delighted that, that um, a local mama is who created it for us. So, Elizabeth, you want to switch slides? For those of you who may be less familiar with Fourth Trimester Arizona, I'll begin with just a brief introduction of our organization. We connect maternal and child health providers, social support systems, and parent support groups to foster collaboration, education, and to increase access to local resources. Our programming includes three main focus areas, our monthly village meetups for new parents, our annual fourth trimester conference for both parents and professionals, and lastly, today's focus area, our newly developing fourth trimester ecosystem initiative for all who care for pregnant people, new mothers, and their babies. The goal of the fourth trimester ecosystem is to facilitate inclusive conversations about what is working and what needs to change to better support new families in Arizona. Elizabeth, if you could advance the slide. Thank you. I'm delighted to announce the registration for Arizona's inaugural fourth trimester ecosystem summit went live this morning. The ecosystem summit will be a full day online event for all those who support new families, including healthcare providers, birth workers, community health workers, child care providers, researchers, nonprofits, and more. Together, we will have conversations around where our families are and have been during this pandemic and how we can move forward as a state, as a unified fourth trimester ecosystem of those who give care and support to new families. Some of the things we will talk about are maternal and infant mental health, birthing and postpartum stories, the impact of the past 18 months on Arizona's birthing people of color, and healing from secondary trauma. As a grassroots organization, Fourth Trimester Arizona is so pleased to be able to present this summit with support from the Arizona Department of Health Services. We will drop the link in the, in the chat to register. There's no cost and we'd love to have you register today. You wanna advance the slide, Elizabeth? Thank you. Jenny, I'm not really sure what just happened. Are you seeing the, the registration link? Is that what you're seeing? Okay. I'm still seeing this way. Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm seeing the registration link. So you a little hang on one sec. Let's do this again. Just advance one more slide. Yep. We'll do. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right. For today, we expect our time together to flow something like this. Our intention is to spend the majority of our time listening to the speakers' experiences, so about 25 minutes, and discussing what we hear, then in smaller breakout rooms for about 20 minutes. Before we get started, let's review a, review a few key items to ensure everyone is fully able to participate. During the presentation, please post all comments and questions in the chat box. We will be monitoring, monitoring the chat and responding to your comments and questions. We ask that you please remain muted, except for when you're in your, your breakout rooms. Of course, then please unmute and just join the discussion. Um, and next, we request that you please enable your video, if you're able, especially during the breakout sessions. Of course, if you run into bandwidth issues, please turn off your camera. Or if you're nursing a baby and you don't want everyone to watch, that's totally fine too. <laughs> um, but yeah, especially during breakout sessions, it really helps to have your camera enabled. And lastly, we're recording this session so we can send you and anyone else who registered a recording of the session. Awesome. Now on to the part we've all been waiting for. Today, we're focusing on the impact of COVID-19 on infant feeding, and we'll hear from three perspectives in the following order. First, Gabriella Reza, a mother. Then Erica Glaze, a health and childbirth educator and breastfeeding peer counselor. And then Kimberly Morsalis, founder of Indigenous Breastfeeding Arizona and the Arizona Intertribal Breastfeeding Coalition. We thank all three of you for being willing to share your experiences with each of us. For all of us who will be listening, 
it's helpful to consider that we come together with different maternal and child health focuses, yet we are all interconnected through the perinatal period and beyond. Please keep the following questions in mind for your breakout room discussion. All right. Elizabeth, if you want to go to the next slide. Our first speaker, Gabby, is a mama to her daughter whom she nursed 47 months. She has served birthing families since 2009 and became a comadre of the Siwapatli Collective in 2015. She is currently finishing her education to become a licensed midwife. She is also a biling bilingual childbirth labor coach at Nuevo Amanecer Servicios Prenatales for families who desire to learn and practice comfort measures for labor and receive rebozo support during the pregnancy and postpartum period. Gabby, if you'd like to unmute and share your experience with us, that'd be wonderful. And Gabby, you might still be muted. Hi. Oh, there you are. Thank you. Thank oh, you. hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you can see me in this sharing a picture of my baby. I gave a, um, did you happen to get the picture, Elizabeth? No? I did. I did. I'm going to pull it up right now. Thank you. Okay. I'll come back in person during the questions and all that, but that way um, there's something on the screen. So <laughs> I'm going to try to keep it short. I know we're trying to do our best to cover a very um, serious subject in a short amount of time, but I'm so glad that we're addressing it. And I'm so glad that, you know, Fourth Trimester Arizona has brought us all together today to talk about this. And this is definitely just from the get go, this is a to be continued conversation because it is hard to talk about this in uh, 10 minutes. You know, I'm going to do my best to share my perspective and my story as, as a, you know, a birthing person who I did breastfeed my my little one for 47 months, you know, and it was definitely a struggle during the pandemic. So I'm, I'm so thankful that I get to share this here. I was nervous about it, you know, because it's definitely a sensitive subject and it's a very personal story. Um, but then I thought about it and if we deliver our truth and we deliver the message of um, reclaiming um, what's it's every human right. Every human has the right to feed their, their child the first food that comes from our milk. And uh, we should be able to, to have that right, you know? And so that's why I was willing to participate. And um, when I looked at the questions and the questions, you know, said like, how has COVID-19 impacted um, a breastfeeding experience? The first thing that came to my mind was, well, prior to COVID-19, we have been we have been challenged and impacted with our breastfeeding experience because there has been so much chatter and so many things happening, especially to Black Indigenous people of color for so long. You know, every culture has historical trauma. Every culture has um, severe uh, intergenerational healing to be able to get that opportunity to even have skin to skin with our baby. You know, um, so many triggers came up when, when the word got out that uh, COVID-19 precautionary measures were going to be taking place in uh, all of the hospital settings. Um, and then the mind and, and the body and spirit began to work in fight or flight, flight or fight, flight or fight. It was just like that all the time. Um, I remember people coming that had not ever been interested in, in out of hospital birth and they were looking for other options because they had to think ahead of every worst case scenario. And so millions and millions and millions of uh, people were affected and the world was affected, everybody was affected, you know? And so it's, it's so hard to put it in a nutshell, but for me on a personal level, um, I couldn't have gotten through my fourth trimester without the support from my lactation peer counselors, my sisters, my, my midwives, my, um, my community I had a whole village, like, like you all say, you know, it does take a village. 
And, and I'm so thankful that you all are doing the work you do. You know, Erica and Kimberly are, are doing incredible work. And I'm so thankful to be able to be here because when, when I was in recovery from um, my emergency cesarean birth, I really wasn't able to be of support. And it took me several years to be able to help other um, birthing persons. And it took me several years to be able to help with postpartum care. I mean, it took me so long to recover from my birth. And so um, I'm barely now, you know, during the pandemic was when I finally was able to start helping and start attending births again and, and helping by sharing my story again. And so, um, that was my fourth trimester. I, I couldn't have made it without that help. And so I, I wanted to share that. And um, then during the pandemic, the situation was um, rather difficult because I thought my daughter was actually almost done. I was like, oh, maybe she's going to self wean. You know, maybe she feels like it's all, you know, maybe I was coming to closure with that chapter of my life of thinking that that was over. But <laughs> you know, she didn't self wean. She actually, she actually wanted more. And so I continued to uh, breastfeed. And one day I came home from work and had a really messed up headache. And I didn't know what happened. I'm like, oh man, this is a really gnarly headache. It's pretty bad. And I just kept on thinking the worst, right? I was like, the COVID-19 tests weren't out yet. It was just, it was the very beginning. And I came home from work and I was just feeling really weird, but it was just a gnarly headache. I continued to nurse my daughter and I, I rarely ever tell her no, unless, unless I really need a break. Um, but if she feels the need, um, my daughter has relied on my milk almost as a form of survival because uh, she didn't do well in her infanthood or her toddlerhood with many foods. She had allergic reactions to cow's milk and um, different kind of things used to make her break out. So my milk was like our form of survival. And so I was like, okay, we're just going to nurse through this, through this, whatever I'm feeling. I don't know what it is. It just feels weird. I'm gonna keep nursing, I'm gonna keep nursing. And then uh, five months later, when I was able to get an antibody test done, the antibody screening for COVID came back and I was had antibodies. And my little one didn't get sick during that time that I was nursing. And so it put my heart at ease to think that all of that doubt, all of those, those uh you know, that doubt and that chatter that is out there about our milk contaminating our babies. You know, there was so much confusion. People didn't have data. People were confused. I, I, I don't have, I don't have anger towards the hospital. The hospital saved my baby's life. I'm not bashing on, on hospitals. I know that they are, they save our lives and the people there are working harder than anyone. I know that it is not, I'm not saying anything negative against my hospital experience, but the confusion that was out there, the confusion about um, not allowing babies to be in the same room as their mommy, as their, as their birthing, you know, biological birthing person that gave birth to them. They weren't, there was so much confusion that mothers and babies were being separated. Um, Again, this is all bringing back historical trauma. This is all triggering us on so many levels. And so I, it wasn't until December, 2020 when the CDC came out with their statement saying that it is healthier for, for uh, mothers and babies to be in the same room, even if she's COVID positive. It is, it is healthier for her to receive the milk, for baby to receive the milk and skin to skin and you know 24 hours in the same room whether or not she's positive or not like cdc came out with that barely in december 2020 so all of the people that had to go through um through all of that hell where they were being separated they they have their trauma now now they're healing from that and so 
there is grief on every level, on every level, and, and it amplified during the pandemic. Thanks so much, Gabby, for, for sharing that and, and um, especially the intimate times that you had and the feelings that you had and, and being so vulnerable about, vulnerable about it and sharing your postpartum experience as really, really powerful. Um, yeah, I, I think that we all can feel, you know, some similar concern and passion and, um, you know, emotion and some grief around that as well. I think we all do. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, so now we will move to hear the experience of Erica Glaze. She's a health and childbirth educator and breastfeeding peer counselor for the Arizona WIC program. She also has a master's of public health and given her own challenges with breastfeeding and experience with being an exclusive pumper, she has a passion for supporting parents who exclusively pump. Erica is married and has a two-year-old son. In her free time, she enjoys the outdoors, reading poetry books and visiting local markets. Erica, I welcome you to unmute yourself and share your experience with us. Thank you, Jenny. Um, thank you for having me too. Um, and just also to add, I am with Jenny at the Arizona Breastfeeding Center. Um, so I'm so glad that they welcomed me into that space. Um, and I'm currently one of their interns there, um, completing pathway three um, to become an IBCLC. So it's exciting to be there with them. Um, but again, back to this topic, I think when I first, when I first saw the questions and the topic, um, two words came to mind. And the first was um, resilience. And the second one was resistance. Um, and so as my, in my work as a peer counselor, and even just being at the, um, the center with Jenny and the other lactation consultants, I have really seen some parents just pushing through um, with the pandemic getting really creative and finding resources and finding the support that they need. I think the one thing that I've seen that's been really hard for parents is that lack of human connection um, because the world completely shut down for a little bit. And so we lost a lot of those support groups and those opportunities to actually see people and to touch people and to hug people. And all of those little things that we probably didn't think about before became a really big deal for a lot of parents, especially on their postpartum journey. Um, but I definitely have seen parents get creative and figure out how to support themselves. Um, and they have started to reach out too to different programs and support. Um, for example, at WIC, I had a mom recently um, tell me that I was the only support that she had. Um, and so she really appreciated having someone that she could just text um, or someone that she could just call because she didn't have that support and she wasn't sure where to get it from. And so I think looking at programs like the peer counseling program and other programs where we can have that peer support for our families is so critical right now. Um, because I think parents want to feel like they're not alone, like there's somebody else out here going through the exact same thing um, or something similar. Um, and then the other word that I shared was resistance. And I think that is probably the most exciting thing um, for me right now especially when it comes to BIPOC families. Um, so Jenny mentioned that I'm also a childbirth educator. Um, and so I wanted to share a story um, of one of the families that I recently worked with. Um, it was a first time mom, she identifies as Latina. Um, towards the end of her pregnancy, the doctor let her know that she had gestational diabetes and that because she had gestational diabetes, she was automatically gonna have a C-section. And so her and I talked, um, she came to my childbirth class, very emotional, not really understanding why this was the recommendation. She didn't really feel like she had a voice, like they were listening to her, like what her options were. Um, and she just kind of felt defeated, um, like anyone would if you immediately heard, oh, you have A, so automatically B is gonna happen without any any support in that. And so we went through the childbirth class. Um, we talked a lot about, about how birth and breastfeeding are connected um, and how that birth experience can really impact breastfeeding because I knew this mom also really wanted to breastfeed. 
And so we talked about um, what that meant and how that could impact um, breastfeeding getting off to a good start. And so we talked about her birth, ex what she wanted her birth experience to be. We talked about a vaginal birth. We also talked about um, a C-section and she really wanted support with how to advocate for herself. And so we sat down, we came up with questions. We looked at the research related to gestational diabetes and C-section. Um, and she took that information back to her doctor and she said, I'm going to try to have a vaginal birth. And she ended up having a vaginal birth. And it gets me really emotional because I think a lot of BIPOC families feel silenced and they feel like they have to go along with whatever is recommended, especially when it comes from a healthcare worker or a physician. They kind of take that information as truth. And I think it's really easy for them to feel like I have to go along with it. They're the professional. They know what's right. They obviously know that this is what's best for me and my baby without giving them all of the options. And if you have no options, you don't know what's possible for you and you don't know what's possible for your family. But through our interaction, she was able to use her voice and to say to them, no, like you're gonna give me a chance to have a vaginal birth. This is what I want. This is what I want for my baby. And she was able to do that. And so that just made me feel like this is the work that we're doing. Like, this is why this work is so important because we have families who need us to help them along this way, to help them find their voice and to give them the tools that they need. And so I was so happy for her. I was so excited. I'm like, yes, yes. Like, this is what I want. Like, I want you to resist and I want you to feel like you can say no. And if you feel like you can't say no, like we'll help you find someone else who will support you, who will support your feeding preferences, who will support your birth preferences too. Um, and so those two words have been like the thing for me, um, resilience and resistance um, from the families that I'm seeing. And I wasn't planning to cry today, so I don't have any <laughs> tissue with me. Um, but yeah, thank you for allowing me to share, to share that truth and to share that perspective. Mm -hmm. Erica, I think, I think you're probably not the only one crying. Um, <laughs> and I really appreciate you sharing your stories. And um, that one is particularly powerful. Um, yeah, wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for being here and um, giving us that, that, you know, peace that, you know, we can move forward and that, you know, with support, these mothers can, can have what they need. That's really, really powerful. All right, now we will hear from Kimberly Morsalis. Kim has over eight years of experience in clinical and educational lactation, as well as peer counseling. She is the founder of Indigenous Breastfeeding AZ and the Arizona Intertribal Breastfeeding Coalition. She also serves as one of the first Indigenous women on the US Breastfeeding Committee Board of Directors. Growing up on and off the Navajo Nation and residing in various tribal communities throughout her life, Kim is passionate in utilizing her education and experience to promote healthy living through kinship values. She enjoys spending time with her husband of 23 years and three daughters of whom she breastfed until they were two years old. You notice I'm like still a little bit like teared up here because I love Kim and I love Erica <laughs> so much. Um, and you guys are such amazing women, but um, I'm so delighted to have you to here today, Kim. Go ahead and unmute yourself and share your experience. Hi, good afternoon. Yat A. Uh, it's very important to me to identify my four clanships in my family. Um, I'm also here as an Indigenous um, Native Zong woman. Um, and again, thank you, Jenny, for having me. Um, I have a lot of emotions right now hearing both stories. And I told Jenny earlier that I, I know I don't want to go first. I'm fine. <laughs> Now, I wish I went first, so I don't feel so choked up and having a lot of um, 
you know, emotions about what is spoken here. And there's so many things, so many levels that we don't understand. Um, it's just so much that families have to endure during the pandemic. Um, I used to work at Valley Wise Medical Center for almost nine years. Um, and I was there actually just recently resigned on July 14th to actually move in the direction of empowering families to also advocate for their birthing um, rights um, on, their, on their sovereign land, also to reclaim what is theirs and known to have their own ancestral knowledge, um, which is breastfeeding and birth. Um, so that's currently where I'm at. Um, I took that big leap to, um, again, also show moms how to, um, you know, advocate for themselves in the hospital, um, understand what is birth to them and what that means to our indigenous um, ancestral knowledge. Um, as far as my experience in the hospital setting, um, again, I was there during the pandemic. Um, it was pretty much um, what you see on, see on TV um, with the news, with very, being a very chaotic. Um, we um, did not know what to do with families um, because we didn't know how the virus would react to um, the, you know, the mom carrying her baby and how it would react with the baby. Um, breastfeeding. So um, they did separate during that time. Um, a lot of families were very much just in flight and fight and flight mode. They didn't know what to do. Um, most of the time, uh, most of the families I serve were, were from very much BIPOC communities. And um, a lot of this, what we, what we know is that these families were triggered with historical trauma um, from what they only knew from their past and from their ancestors. And so um, when they were told that they could not be with their babies or they have to have to be separated, it was a very traumatic experience. Um, a lot of families I, I served um, were, you know, of course, heartbroken. Um, this also goes back to even how the health health care healthcare system um, history has 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 treated people of color, um, especially for indigenous people, um, not trusting the system. Um, and it really brought back a lot of a lot of triggers for us. And um, you know, as far as you know, what had happened, we we definitely um, I think we we all collect did a collect a measure with a lot of the um, healthcare organizations um, and really got that ball rolling. I was um, uh, on the committee to help move that um, on a national level to what the hospitals are we're going to do. Um, but I felt like that that part of, of, of having the birth would have happened really fast. Um, so we were able to really push that um, policy, get that going and really move in the direction that we wanted to. Um, what I worry about too is um, not only did the families experience this, this, this time of period of the pandemic, we have to think about how much the unresolved grief happens. So we know the grief happened to the family, but what happens after the fact? And that's where we now see families experiencing those post-traumatic stress disorders. Um, and in my work now is reclaiming that, healing from that, reclaiming, and going back to our own ways that we always knew it was there. Thank you so much, Kim. That was very powerful. Um, and thank you for your perspective and for joining us today, way over um, from Minnesota, where you're doing another one of these amazing, amazing reclaiming and restoring Indigenous breastfeeding counselor um, trainings. We're so delighted to have you. Um, this was so powerful, ladies. Um, and I think probably everybody on the call is thinking the same thing. Um, I'm sending all of you, Gabby, Erica, and Kim, so much love for being willing to share your experiences and your emotions and your unique perspectives as we work together to support Arizona families. We're so honored that you're willing to share with us today, especially how the BIPOC populations have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and, and we just can't thank you enough for, for being here and taking the time out of your very busy days to do that. So thank you so much. Um, we want to acknowledge that each of us on the call may have had different experiences than those we've heard today, and that's okay. At fourth trimester Arizona, we believe that informed choice is key, and we're in no way attempting to promote any one choice over the other. Um, we do have time for a brief Q&A before heading into breakout rooms. Elizabeth, would you mind sharing any questions from the chat? 
Um, Jenny, I would love to. Right now, we don't have any questions in the chat, but if anyone has one out there, um, please drop it in there. Or uh, if you want to unmute and ask your question, I believe that would be acceptable as well. I hear lots of thanks for hearing these stories. <laughs> yeah, amazing. I see one new message. Yeah, okay. Yes, I think that these are all really powerful, and you know, I'm I'm moved by hearing them, and also by having these thoughts now, and you know, getting my mind opened um, to really the impact that this had in these you know, different groups and populations that are all around us, um, but that we may not have, have seen. Um, and I think that that's really a lot of why we want to form the fourth trimester ecosystem is so that as the people who support new families, we are making sure that we're hearing all the voices and that we are um, all working together towards, you know, similar goals um, so that as a state, we can be better at this. <laughs> Um, so thank you all for, for your um, support and for being here today. Um, I think it's about time for us to go into breakout rooms. Um, and Elizabeth, you want to set the stage for us so our attendees know what to expect? Absolutely. Um, I, I, again, just want to echo Jenny's sentiments, Gabby, Erica, Kim. I genuinely appreciate all of the elements that you brought into this discussion on infant feeding. Um, I feel truly honored to be part of this discussion and to hear the truths that exist. So just wanted to say that and you can hear I'm a little choked up too, um, but I'm gonna perse persevere. Um, so we are gonna hop off of Facebook Live, please. If you could do that first, Megan. And over the next 20 minutes or so,